The fundamental science is here. The fundamental science shows you that you can do active immunotherapy and, and, and help patients, and you can do passive immunotherapy, such as with cytokines or delivery of antibodies that inhibit checkpoints, and you can fundamentally help patients with cancer. Now, the question is, how far does that territory go? Lawrence Cooper, Chief Executive Officer of Xiopharm Oncology, based in Boston. So Xiopharm works on the commercialization of immunotherapies. And immunotherapies are in two broad camps. There is the active world of immunotherapy, where cells are infused into the body, and we therefore have programs in infusing T cells and NK cells, or natural killer cells. And there's also the passive immunotherapy world. The passive immunotherapy world seeks to energize the resident immune system in a patient with cancer. And that can be done, for instance, by administering cytokines. So we have an advanced program. In fact, we have a phase three trial about to start where we have harnessed this particular cytokine called IL-12. And IL-12 activates elements of the immune system, and we're testing that in patients with recurrent brain tumor. So it's the active immune system, the administration of cells, and then it's the passive immune system where one is harnessing the endogenous immune response. Successful companies working in the immunotherapy space have to take on both active immunotherapy as well as passive immunotherapy. Um, both of those are, require technologies that are based on, at least in our world, are based on the genetic modification. So for active immunotherapy, we genetically reprogram, for instance, killer T cells and killer NK cells and infuse them into patients with cancer. And in the passive world, we administer a virus and that virus uncodes a switch. And that switch can be activated by a patient's taking a small molecule called Vladimax and that switch is called the Rio switch. And when patients activate that switch, they can make IL-12. And that IL-12 is a master regulator of the immune system. And once IL-12 is made, then the immune system gets angry. But it's the endogenous immune system, it's the patient's own immune system that gets angry once IL-12 is delivered and then goes to work against the patient's cancer. So 10 years ago, 2006, uh, was a world in which immunotherapy was around. Um, and they were, for instance, uh, in my training, we were using immunotherapy, but we called it bone marrow transplantation. Uh, and Don Thomas was given the Nobel Prize for this uh, back in the 90s. But Don Thomas and others in the field of bone marrow transplantation taught us that immune cells transferred from one patient to another could go to work on cancers, particularly leukemias, that were resistant to all known therapy at the time. But those transplant biologists didn't infuse T cells, they infused stem cells. And the stem cells begat T cells after they were engrafted. And that was a messy business because a lot of biology happened in those patients. The patients had to be conditioned, had to receive whopping doses of chemotherapy or radiation to prepare them for that engraftment. And then the engraft cells often trespassed and recognized normal structures and patients actually were injured through a disease called graft-versus-host disease. But the central principle was that we knew the immune system could work, albeit in this, in this, in this field of bone marrow transplantation. That was 10 years ago, roughly. Going 10 years on, we're now in a world in which we recognize the actor on the stage are the T cells. And can we, instead of infusing stem cells, infuse T cells? Can we get rid of, if in other words, the sort of the messy business of, of transplant biology and focus on the precise biology of T cells and their inherent ability to separate friend from foe? So we sit here in 2017 and we're looking forward to 2027. So that's a world in which T cells are already established therapy. Perhaps NK cells are established therapy. But the, the pressures on the system are can you scale these immunotherapies? Can you scale T cell therapy and NK cell therapies to handle the numbers of patients? So at the moment, 175,000 or so Americans have liquid tumors. Liquid tumors are leukemias, lymphomas, and multiple myeloma. 1.5 million Americans have invasive cancer. 
So liquid tumors are just 1% to 2% of the total problem, and 1.5 Americans have solid tumors. So what kind of inventions, technologies, advancements will be needed in these next 10 years to go from the few numbers of relapsed leukemias and lymphomas that currently benefit from CAR-T to the massive numbers of Americans who have solid tumors as well as other liquid cancers. What, what do we need? So the key really are two, two bookends. On the right is cost. So one has to understand from a design principle how to get the costs under control. At the moment, most companies are focused on scaling up what's been done in academia. In other words, taking a GMP facility, this, this factory, if you would, and being able to harness that factory to make cells using a technology that is based on gene transfer and then growing the cells in like bioreactors. That is an academic practice and it's been scaled. And it can be scaled, but there's a point of diminishing returns. Can it, can it ever scale, for instance, to treat hundreds of thousands of patients a year? The other bookend is control. T cells, when they go into the body, are different from antibodies. They have a nucleus, they have DNA, they can make decisions. And we as biologists can educate those T cells so they can make decisions on our behalf after they've been infused. So you can have, if you would, sort of remote controlled cars, if you would, where you can call up the T cells and have them do your bidding. For instance, if the T cells are super angry, super energized, and the patient is suffering from the side effects of that, sometimes known as cytokine release syndrome, can you call back the soldiers? Can you return them to base? Can you quieten down the system? And you can do that with, with switches. And though, so you have to have two things. You have to have switches for control, and you have to get your costs under control by having fundamental design in your product that gets rid of a lot of the complexities of bioprocessing. So Xyfarm works on cell therapy for sort of our active immunotherapy, infusing T cells and NK cells, uh, particularly using CARs to go after, for instance, CD19 and CD33. But that's just one side of the ledger. The other side of the ledger is harnessing the endogenous immune response. And we do that by using a virus. The virus is called an adenovirus, and that adenovirus is weaponized to control the genes coding for a switch, the Rio switch, as well as the master regulator of the immune system called IL-12. So we've developed technology and now pressure tested this in humans so that we can take this genetically coded adenovirus, directly place it into the brain tumor of patients with recurrent glioblastoma. That's a, that's a horrible brain tumor that many, many patients die of. That adenovirus in the brain tumor can be activated by a small molecule called Valetamex. It's a pill, it's a, it's a capsule, it's a simple oral dosing. Once the patient takes the Valetamex, the Valetamex activates the switch that's deposited by the adenovirus, and then the adenovirus, through its DNA, pumps out IL-12, and not just willy-nilly, but is controlled by the dosing of the Valetamex that the patient's taking. So the patient can tailor the amount of Valetamex, the amount of IL-12 that he or she needs to match the biology that they need to treat their recurrent glioblastoma. And that program now is passed through phase one trial. It's actually in the hands of the regulators now. And we're gonna open a phase three trial to essentially explore the commercial possibilities in, for patients with recurrent glioblastoma. The war on cancer started in 1970, roughly, by Richard Nixon. So it's one of the oldest wars in our nation's history. And there have been three major players, radiation oncology, surgery, chemotherapy. Those are the sort of the, 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 the it, what's this was in the arsenal in that war. The fourth player now is on the field, and that's immunotherapy. The question is, where does immunotherapy go? Does it essentially go alongside radiation oncology and chemotherapy, or does it take over? And what we're really driving for is will it replace chemotherapy? Because that, at the end of the day, is what drives a lot of the anxiety for patients. It's not only that you're gonna get a cancer diagnosis, it's just that your body is gonna get technologies that's gonna wreck it. 
going to wreck it emotionally, financially, and then of course physically, right? So if we're going to make this world a better place, we have to think about, even though it's amazing science, chemotherapy works for many patients, we have to develop new technologies that can replace chemotherapy. The only way I know how to do that is with immunotherapy, because immunotherapy works on a different mechanism of action. Chemotherapy fundamentally separates friend from foe because the cancer cells divide faster than the healthy cells. That's a lot of times the reason chemotherapy works. It poisons the dividing cells. Immunotherapy has an ability to be precise, has an ability to actually recognize cancer cells, not on their ability to replicate, but because these cancer cells are aberrant, they look different to the immune system. So if you can harness immunotherapy, the question on the table is, can we get rid of chemotherapy?